And by now, you should know that uh, the style is always you start it A equals one, A equals two, then you just go for it, right? So today, the first part of the lecture was going to try to say something about SU1. Well, SU2 has this good property. Last time we studied SU2, we we're going to find all the EREP. And I realized, hey, this is what we studied in quantum mechanics. There is the spin one half, then spin one, and da da la. And if you remember the from quantum mechanics, in quantum mechanics, if it's angular momentum, sometimes we're able to say, ah, oh, here's a spin half particle, and here's another spin half particle, and we'll combine them together. And then we can ask, hey, what's the total spin? So there is something called the Klapsch Gordon decomposition, will allow us to add a spin together and to get other reps. So basically, in for the case of SU2, you can actually build all the rest of the EREP, just starting with spin on half, and just keep adding it, and then you, you get them all. And this, luckily, can be done with SU2. So today, we'll try to demonstrate that. So we have been talking a lot about the generators and the Lie algebra and the vector space, and some of you guys really curious about the exact vector space we're talking about. So let's say we take a state belong to this vector space, and we wonder, under a SUN transformation, what happens to this state? And this is what we mentioned from the first class. We imagine that the state will transform as OK, let me actually write. <coughs> the subscript. And this is what we say, why we say that uh, this state psi is if it's in the fundamental representation, a look, it will have the dimension n just as the defining matrix of SUN. And this will be a unitary operator, and it will bring us to some new state. So this is what we meant if we have a state as the fundamental representation of SUN. And what a quantum mechanics enlighten us is we can try to build higher rep using this fundamental rep. But before that, since we have a vector space, we should define some scalar product. So we say that uh, defining scalar product phi per psi, and then we hope that this is invariant under this SU3 transformation. Now this rotation thing. And then we recognize that it is really saying that so this can be defined to be phi psi star psi prime if we have the fun property such that the phi psi star, or our phi star, transform with the complex conjugate of the unitary matrix, such that one of them transform the complex conjugate, one transform as the U. And if you actually want the index to match and for matrix multiplication, you will see u dagger u comes in the middle, and which is 1, because it's unitary. And then this, this k product would work. And this, historically, this thing, sometimes it's 
it's just defined as a bar, which is just really the complex conjugate, and it's called the anti-fundamental representation. Well, fundamental because it's still the same dimension that the transform with the defining matrix of SUN. Now we have to call it something to distinguish. Okay, so we have that. So that is when we only have one index as a subscript. And now we're trying to move forward and study when it has multiple index. So which is known as the tensor representation. This is really mimicking that if I have a particle with some spin and another particle have some spin, and then we combine together and say what happens, what happens to the system. So let's try that. So now I'm studying an object that has two index. It's really the, say, the direct product of two particles. And then we define this kind of object. It just transform each of the index transform as a fundamental. So this is the object we want to study. And uh, well, according to our experience with SU2, when you combine such two objects together, it's reducible. For example, if you combine the two spin one half particle together, and then you will get a spin one particle and a spin zero particle. So then you will, you, then you will look at this and it says, huh, I know you are reducible, and how can, you re how can I reduce it? So, so now we're trying to observe the following fun fact. It says that if you have a reducible representation, that means you can come up with some operator on this representation such that the operation only acts a smaller dimension of space. So that's what we meant, it's reducible. There exist operators that can separate them, and we're trying to bring it into this block diagonal form and stuff like that. So now let's try to find operators that uh, will still transform the presentation like representation like this. And uh, for each part of this representation, it doesn't talk to each other. And a such an operator is given by the permutation operator. Let's say P12. What a P12 does is to switch the index of the first slot and the index of the second slot. So the claim is that if I look at how P12 plus IJ transform, it will transform in the same way. So this operator doesn't affect the transformation rule for this tensor. So let's try to see this. Well, as the permutation operator indicate, the only thing it does is to switch the two index. And according to this tensor's transformation, And then it's really transformed like this. And I'm just going to relabel my K and L. And then switch some numbers around. And this is really this permutation operator acting PKL. 
And if we only focus on this part, you realize indeed, switching the two index doesn't change the transformation law of this tensor. So this is indeed an operator. The P12 is indeed an operator that will preserve this tensor representation. And thus, we can use it as the projection operator to project our tensor into different uh, representations. So thus, we can build SIG, which is just the symmetric object build of the original tensor representation, and the AIG, which is the anti-symmetric part. Oh, if I write it more carefully, it's really using the projection operator. Permutation? Yes, sorry. Yeah, I'm using the permutation operator as a projection operator to project this tensor into two different components. And what we show this part is to say that SIG transform in this way, and so is AIG. They don't talk to each other. And since, hence, we manage to reduce the dimension of this. So this, this tensor representation has been reduced to some two smaller tensor representation in this particular way. OK. So now, let's take a particular example. Let us focus on SU3, which will focus a lot in today's tutorial. You sort of learn everything about SU3, or at least um, in principle everything. And we also have some physics motiv motivation why we like SU3 so much. Yes? Um, sorry, I was just thinking what you meant when you said that they're smaller um, representations. Ah, that's a very good question because we're getting to get to that. Okay. Very good. Why do I claim these are smaller? So basically, I want to count uh, the independent components. Okay. So. So OK, let's answer this question first. So for Poseidon IG, if I, don't, if I don't emphasize, if I don't have any restriction on the index, then this guy will be have n times n independent component. And now if this one is symmetric, that will get down to n plus n times n plus 1 over 2. And this will become n times n minus 1 over 2. So hence, they are reduced. The num number of independent component is reduced. And presumably, you can actually collect all these components and then make a huge list. And then you could build a this by this dimensional operator to act on it. But this is just another way to do so using the tensor language. OK, so now let's focus on SU3. Very good. This is exactly what we want to do. So let's look at the dimension. And then you'll be introduced to a lot of mathematical fun fact. And here is a mathematical fun fact, arithmetic fun fact, that we notice that the 3 times 3 is equal to 6 plus 3. Fun fact. OK, then we should try to explain why this is really fun. <laughs> so this is, as we build, if you notice that, this is really an index 
of our tensor representation that indicates that this object transform as a fundamental under this index. So this indicates we're building some tensor from a fundamental representation. I can really just call it the fun representation. I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. Could you repeat that? I, I, did, I didn't get. Oh, I'm sorry. just sorry. I'm just saying. So basically, this is trying to say psi id is decomposed into sij plus aij. And I'm trying to say that psi id is an object that each of the index transform as a fundamental. Like here. That's one index, and this is two index. And we claim that uh, you can just keep going, except what you build the object is not irreducible by the proof that we just did. It's reduced into SIJ and AIJ. And now I'm just trying to say, to count parameters to say, what do we get here? And so this is the symmetric part, which is given by this formula. You can just count how many free parameters would be in SIJ if we're demanding a symmetric. And this is anti-symmetric. OK, so now we notice something even more interesting in this particular case. Notice that the 3 <coughs> equals 3. OK, this is weird. Let, let me circle the 3 I meant. So hey, there is a three-dimensional representation I call the anti-symmetric one. And here there is a three fundamental. They happen to have dimension three, and it wouldn't work in any other dimensions. Something else would work. But in this particular case, we realize the anti-symmetric guy, AIJ, happen to have the same dimension as the fundamental representation. Or sometimes it's just coincidental. But this time, let's see if we can dig something out of this. Okay. So what are we going to do is that uh, we're going to rewrite AID using Levitivita simple. So I claim that the AID is nothing but an object IJK plus IJK. <coughs> if you think about it, it's true. <coughs> well, let's see. Maybe I should label it a little better. Mm. Yeah, it doesn't fit right properly in this assortment. Yeah, yeah, I know. Let, let, let me see. OK. So let's. You need one of that. You need one of that to the left because you want that. You're only summing over. I think you only contract. You should only contract two, where one index. Fine. No, no, we contract two, Let me check right? So, so let's say on the side, pick i plus one. I get x long one two three plus i two three plus epsilon one three two plus i three two. Everything else vanish. This one gives me plus i two three minus plus i. It's just not. So this guy is mapped to two, one jk equals two three. But that's the same. So this is a two three. It's just not mapped in the way that each side is choosing one index. But but you can see what I meant that these two things as an ensemble when I run through all the index. This, this two ensemble are the same thing. Yes? Right? So there is like, you can build a one to one map from all the components of AJK, which is anti symmetric, 
and to this object. Okay? All right, how is this going to help me? So, how do you think this Levitivita symbol is going to transform under, under this guy, under all this? So if I define an object, well, it has three index. So let's define this object to epsilon prime, which is trans, okay, I'm going to run up letters. PQR, and then with P contracted, Q to contracted, and uh, here. So what do you think of this epsilon IDK prime? It's. So this is just our expectation. That's how this thing should be transformed. Yep. Don't you sum over the second component of the U tensors to transform, to do a basic transformation? Like. Uh-huh. Yeah, because if you think about it, it's like major. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yep. So, hmm. okay. So do you do you remember that how we define our determinant? There is a fun, really fancy way of defining determinant using Levi-Civita symbol. Okay, let's just use, I'll just write a bunch of dots. The determinant of a particular matrix is defined this way. You get a minus. And then you can just generalize this to n, n dimension in the world. And there is a proof in Anthony Zay's group book, the first chapter of review linear algebra in the group theory in a nutshell. So this is just a very condensed way of writing our determinant, which is coming from this. Remember our way of finding the determinants, pick a row, and use this guy times that, subtract the next guy, and plus that again. And since we're alternating signs, which is captured by all this epsilon. Okay, so now if I take a special unitary matrix, the determinant is just one, and this is just the unitary matrix. So this tells us that Levitivita simple actually doesn't transform under the SUN transformation. So what this gave us, and furthermore, you can see that you can actually move while this unitary matrix over just by multiply the inverse. Remember the inverse is just the 
transpose of the complex, just the adjoint of the U. And what you, we get is something like this. Okay? You're like, what are you doing? Good question. But now let's figure out this object we built that is a, another way of writing down a JK is our anti-symmetric representation. So now we know this guy transform as epsilon, epsilon JK because epsilon doesn't transform. And the other one transform as it should because it has this two of this fundamental index. But this, but then the, 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 the formula we just proved, because the epsilon doesn't transform under SU and transformation, it actually pick up something like this. I'm sorry. Can you, yeah. can you repeat why it doesn't transform? So you have no, okay, it doesn't transform. It's because the definition of the determinant. Oh, okay, so the determinant is just this. The determinant is one, because we're dealing with special unitary matrix. Okay, I need to keep track of my indexes. So this guy would give me something with IPQ left. Transforms with the complex conjugate. Like the expression you have above mm -hmm. is different from the one below. You have to take some transposes there and then probably pick up some complex conjugates along, along the way. I mean, it, I can mm -hmm. see in the end it will work, mm -hmm. but it's just not clear the way you want it. I, if you take the complex conjugate of the mm -hmm. uh, of the expression at the second last row, this one. Yeah, I think you get oh. the same thing as below, and then you can use it, and then. Yeah. 
because mm -hmm. in, in the in the unitary matrix you have indices swapped between the two rows, right? Correct. That that is a problem. But you can just take the transpose that gives you a complex conjugate with indices for. There are some index problems that uh, I'll fix later. I'll make sure the one show up in the notes have the correct index, keep, keep correct track of the indices. There is some index problem that I need to fix. But it will work in the end. But yeah, I don't. So it's basically taking this expression and try to multiply it by u inverse. Some index. And then this guy will disappear on the other side. Okay, let me let me figure it out a bit. Sorry. So what do we have said is that if you give me a tensor representation. I can build some symmetric part of it and an anti-symmetric part of it, and then these guys will be irreducible, and that those are actually the representation will work with. And then what it's shown here, well, with some index problems that it needs to fix, is that because of this formula, and then we can prove that the anti-symmetric part is like, behave like anti-fundamental. So let, let me try to write things without index. So what is being claimed is that because for special unitary matrix, epsilon is equals to some epsilon times a bunch of use, and there are n of them. And I can move one of them over, and it says epsilon times one of this u stars, and it equals to n minus one of them. So if I imagine there is a tensor is n minus one index, it will actually transform as a anti-fundamental. So this is what I have been, what I have tried to prove and I failed to keep track of the index. So the next step is, of course, trying to go through Poisson IJK and then say there are some completely symmetric part and, and there is partially symmetric and anti-symmetric and completely anti-symmetric and keep track of all of them and to find out how to figure that guy out. Yes? Um, I have just kind of a question about the whole general thing. So. Yep. Uh, so we have some like vector space right. where basically like these matrices live, right? Yeah. And these matrices act. Which ones now? I thought that's 
but psi has two indices, and it's like a it's, it's like a vector space, right? So psi is the it is a tensor. Yes, yeah, psi is an element in the vector space. The psi with one index is the element of the vector space. So why does that psi have? Why do these have two? It, because it's a vector space made of tensor. And yeah. That's what he's asking. Is it or is it a vector space that the tensor? Yeah, yeah. Like, I no. think it's the second one. That, no, okay, no, okay. Have, I think we are seeing representations of S U of S U N on a tensor space, okay. and, and we give the transformation law by applying on every index. But I thought for it to be a vector space, like you have to be able to add. You would think you have to be able to add each element. Together, mm -hmm. like you have to take any element and be able to add it to another, right? So then, mm -hmm. like, you, how can you have elements with one index and elements with two index indices? It's not the same. Maybe they're not living in the same space, right? Okay. So, like, I am just trying to understand why, like, how you can have a different transformation law mm -hmm. for like two things that are in the same space when like the unitary transformation is kind of like a change of coordinates, right? So should like how can you have a different transformation law for two things living in the same vector space? Or does that not live in like the same I, I don't think Psi J and Psi would be living in the same space. So this is but this is saying like that a AJK mm -hmm. transforms differently than like psi I J. But those like live in the same vector space, right? Oh, okay. So I just like I'm having a hard time, you can always like intuitively understanding why those two things would transform differently. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, like like, like basically this is where. Yeah, like I mm -hmm. psi, psi i j lives in some vector space and it uh -huh. transforms with like u, right? Mm -hmm. Because and that's kind of like a change of coordinates or something like mm -hmm. right? change of basis. Mm -hmm. So like if you make S I J yeah. out of summing mm -hmm. to to psi yeah. out like things mm -hmm. in, in that vector space, mm -hmm. it's still in that vector space <laughs> because mm -hmm. of the sum of those things. Mm -hmm. And so how can like this change of basis at like make it transform differently? That's what like I'm trying to mm -hmm. understand that. So 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 what is, you can think about Psi J, let's still take A equals three as an example. If you take all the component, you'll be able to make a, say, nine dimensional vector. Uh, okay, out of. So, so this is like Psi one one, Psi one two, Psi one three, Psi two one, Psi two two, Psi two three. Okay. Right? And then sure. this thing will transform with some nine by nine matrix. Okay, why wouldn't we just write psi as like a matrix and have that matrix transform like like that it's doesn't easier to okay. do okay. It does. <coughs> right? Sure. Okay. And what is this is saying that if you do this above combination, this matrix will look block diagonal. There is a six by six here, there's a three by three. Okay. That's all it's saying. Okay. And then furthermore, they say this three by three matrix is nothing but the complex conjugate of the original. And this is okay. really, what I'm saying is that that transformation law, you can map it one to one onto this this nine dimensional description. Okay. Okay. So now. Uh, yeah. Yep. Can you? I'm not sure. I understand, understand what you. So we had something with n index and then. So, so, so you move on to the other side. So we start with this determinant formula. Yeah. And it says that epsilon with an index. So, so OK. Let me write more on this. So let's generalize 
what we just found to S U N. Okay, okay, sorry. And this one has an index. I'm not labeling them because if I label them, I'll make a mistake. And this one has an index of them. Okay, so I can label this as I1 to IN. And this is like J1 to JN. And this is like I1, J1, I2, J2, and with some dot dot in the mid between. So this is what I meant. So this still works. This is just the definition of a determined except the determinant of u is taken to be 1, because we're studying a special unitary matrix. And what I'm saying is you can always multiply by one of the u's inverse to get a formula like this. This tells us that if I have an object that has n minus 1 index and is completely anti-symmetric, then this guy will transform as an anti fundament Just because the argument there, which have some mislabeled index. So that guy. So if I have an object which is completely anti-symmetric, I can build a n-dimensional object out of this by multiplying epsilon. Okay, so this is saying that for three-dimensional, for SU3, an index with three minus one, which is two subscript, you can build a anti-symmetric representation and it will transform as a fundamental. I'm just saying this would work if you just write, rewrite this part with morph. Okay, so, so, so this one should have transformed with a bunch of U, but then you can write epsilon to psi transform with one U star. OK, maybe I should write this, this in tutorial. OK. No, still not clear. A little bit more. It's just this argument? Uh, it's the, line, the bottom line. This bottom line? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, this is the bottom line. It says if this is a completely anti-symmetric object with n minus 1 index, I can use the n-dimensional levity beta to make it such that it will transform with the anti-fundamental. OK. So let's carry on and then write psi i dk and then try and decompose that guy. And you can see that I went through quite a lot of trouble and not keeping track all of the index correctly. I'm trying to say this thing is decomposable and then we decompose this way. Oh, I see. Sorry, that just made sense. Okay. And uh, okay, so, so the, it seems that we're going to go through even more trouble if we want to do this guy. And this is one we decided to take a different route and then talk about something called a young tablet. Your tableau is just a two. So it's using this two, you can just draw some boxes. And these boxes will give you all the irreducible representation you want in SUN. OK? So the following, I can't prove. Well, I proved uh, so for one equation in your tableau, and, uh, and I'm not interested in proving the next one. So we'll just introduce this thing. Young Tableau says, oh, it sort of makes sense. Well, first we realize we can always write down some tensor 
representation and decompose it to, into objects that have some symmetric and anti-symmetric property. And the Untable is just a way to organize them. Says that we will represent each fundamental representation as a box. And then, in order to, to signify that it's symmetric, and we'll just try out two boxes in a row. So this guy is equivalent to Sij, which is the projection of Psi using the permute the first two index. So in Young Table, if you say a row of thin boxes, they are just completely symmetric under all those rows. And in order to say what, what if something is anti-symmetric, and then they just, they just draw a box in a column. So this is AID. <laughs> So Jan Tablo is a two, trying to organize everything we said so far, how to decompose tensor representation as such, into some boxes. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. And what if we have like higher dimensional tensors in which, I, I'm not sure if we can always uh, decompose them into a symmetric form and anti-symmetric form. No, it'll be like completely symmetric, completely anti-symmetric. Then, then there is an object like symmetric under this two index, okay. and anti-symmetric in the other two boxes. So, so for example, so for this precise IJP thing, in the on top of you can just draw a box like this. So, so it's completely anti-symmetric under these index and the, the symmetric under those. I think. So that's why I don't want to really go into Poseidon and can they use tons of epsilon, try to contract them, say how they transform, and argue that they transform in a certain representation. It's going to be a huge headache. And then what we learned in Young Tableau is that the, the cute fun fact we just find is anti-fundamental E on top of is represented by n minus one box. This will be n bar, and this is n, and all the rest <coughs> we have to figure out how to count them. So that's basically what a young tableau is. It says. Instead of writing down things with millions of the indexes and trying to keep track of them once we act on by special unitary matrices, let's just draw boxes. Okay, so then we run into trouble things like what if we double count? So there is a rule of a legal Young table. So they say if you follow this rule, then you will never draw that young table that uh, would overcount or doesn't exist. It says basically it looks looks like an inverse staircase. So for example, this could be legal. So if you flip it, you can imagine that you can step onto it as if they are stair. So this will be all right. But for example, this guy is not all right. Like nobody stares do it that way. If you flip it, well, it looks the same, but uh, it doesn't look like a stair you can step on. It will <coughs> fall.
fall apart if you step on the staircase. So they say, OK, maybe I should write down some more detailed rules. It says from top to down, number of box in a row should not increase. And from left to right, number of box in the column should not increase. So that would be a valid on Tableau. And that is it. And also you say, that each column should have at most n boxes. It doesn't really make sense for anything that is completely anti-symmetric, says your index only go up as far as n, but I have more than n indexes, then you just vanish. OK. So that means that n had better be bigger or equal to 4. Actually, you can get rid of this. Because if it's, so that if n equals 4, you have four box in a row, that's just a trivial representation because you only have one component. OK. So this master says, as long as you draw a legal young tableau, that will give us an irreducible representation. And now the question is how to come like if I give you a young tableau, how many dimensions it has, somehow the dimension of the representation is very interesting object, as we will explore in our tutorial. OK, so this is the way to count them, is that you're going to assign numbers to these boxes and then divide them. So first, if I wonder, hey, I have a representation that look like this, what's the dimension of this representation? And the rule is you write n on your very first box, and that you, as you go towards right, you add a one. If you go down, you subtract one. And you get a box of numbers. And we'll leave them alone. And then for the boxes, the same on table on the denominator, we count something which is called a hoax. So you draw a hook, which is centered at one of the box. And you count how many the hooks, how many boxes the path through. In this case, this is a four. This is three. This is one. This is a two. This is one. And the dimension of this rep, which could be very complicated, it's just calculated by multiplying everything above and divided by the product of everything below. Sorry, how do you place the numbers? So why is it two, for example? So you draw a hook. Oh, okay. And then you see how many boxes this hook passed by. Okay. Or you can say, count the boxes to the right 
of the box you are interested and count all the boxes below and add one for yourself. So these are known as the hook numbers. So what does the N stand for in this example? It's really if you're talking about the S U N. So this could be this could be a representation for S U three, S U four, S U five, then they say and they are all the same. As we can show, right, is that the anti-fundamental can be, doesn't matter what's the number of n, it's always represented by n minus one boxes. And Jan Tablo says, doesn't matter which s u n we're talking about, this representation always exists. But of course, it will have a different dimension, depends on which s u n we're talking about. So that's counting the dimension of the tableau. Don't ask me why this works. <laughs> I can show you it works for this. Say so this as this is using our SU3 example. This is three and a four, and this is a two and a one. And then indeed, it gave me dimension six. And for a slightly complicated example, we can draw a box like this. And then three, four, three? No, two. And this is hook number three, one, one. So this gave me three times four times two times divide by three. This one gave me eight. And this eight is very interesting as you would see in today's tutorial. Can I ask a question? Yeah. According to the rules, it's yeah. apparently possible to have more than difference of one when you go from top to bottom, more than difference of one box in a row, so that you can have in the first row, you can have three, and then in the next one, you can have one. Uh-huh. Right. According to the rules. Yeah. But then, if you have such um, non-uniform differences uh -huh. between uh -huh. the rows, then this method. Uh -huh. OK, you are proposing, let's look at a young tableau like this. For example. Mm -hmm. Or that if the difference is um, first, it could be a difference of two, then it could be a difference of one, then a difference of so that it's not uniform, and then when you count the dimensions in that way uh -huh. of such a uh -huh. configuration, yeah, then it will work. So it will still work. So so is this one of the young table you are? What you want? Well, but here it's only one, so it's oh uniform. okay, it's uniform because this because there's, there's only two rows. How about this one? OK, yeah, it's a very complicated rep representation, but you can still do it. So there's n and plus 1, and plus 2, and plus 3, and minus 1, and then minus 2. Now this is just multiply all this together and divide it by the hook numbers. It will still work, as long as it's a legal young tablet. Okay, so in terms of a young tableau, it's now much easier. Well, drawing boxes are definitely easier than keeping track of indexes of unitary matrices and the representation. And think about this if you want to write it that way, it has like seven indexes and you have to keep track of all of them, which is symmetric, which is anti-symmetric, and using what kind of elevator with a simple and how many of them can I reduce that into, well, that's it is irreducible, but it's going to be insane. So now, we'll try to combine Young Tableau together. So there is a more sophisticated recipe how to combine two arbitrary young tableau together. 
But for the questions of how to combine, see if I have a irreducible representation, and then I want to just add a fundamental on it, and how to decompose it. And then for young tableau, it's easy. I have a question. Yes. Can you see? So the the two boxes side by side there. That's saying yeah. that you have some. So it's in SU three, and you have an anti-symmetric tensor. That's you have saying, right? a symmetric. Or sorry, that's what I meant. Symmetric tensor, right? And right. It's, and it's and like basically what the method does is tell you how many free, like how many yeah. like degrees yeah. of freedom or whatever, like right, how many right. parameters you need. Right. So. What what in words does that bottom one say? With like, does it say that like it has like? It has. So so basically, you can say this always mean that uh, you have psi i j k, and then you use one half one plus p one two to signify the first two are symmetric. And then you use 1 minus p13 to signify that those two are anti symmetric. OK. So you can always rewrite the Young tableau using this guy. OK. Says that you're just symmetrizing yeah. some index and anti symmetrizing okay. some other index. And then this counting tells us after you symmetric and anti symmetric that away, how many free parameters are we left? Okay, so how to <coughs> attach the entablo to each other? So basically, this is a question we asked at the beginning. If I'm given by some representation, give back some other representation. And can we decompose it? The Antablo says, well, that's easy. So if for a single box, just attach it such that the result is still legal. Let me pull this guy over. So suppose I have a really complicated, really complicated young tableau. And then I ask, what if I want to attach a box to it? It says, well, to attach the box anywhere you want. From the right. And the down. Such that you still have a legal young tableau. So for example, I can attach my box here. That's fine. OK, this looks like the original color. So this will be a fine final representation. But I can't really attach here. If I attach here and not attaching there, then this doesn't look like a staircase. So that is a bad location. OK. So this is crazy. Let me just redraw them. So what I'm saying is that I can attach to this box here. That will be a good representation. And then I can try to attach here, but then that doesn't work. And I can attach it here. That's fine. And then I can continue to do this. And 
and then I can do the last one. And those are the, all the possible location I can attach this box to. Some of them are le not legal, then we just delete them. So this tells us this original young tableau, when I multiply a fundamental with it, I'll get this four different representation. <coughs> yep. And do you have to pick one of them or do you have to add them all together? You add them all together. So, that, so this is a very complicated scenario. I can just do this for how do I attach a single box to a single box? So this gave me that plus this. And this is the fun fact formula we write down at the beginning, which is three times three equals six plus three four. And it is really following this rule, so as you can attach from the right, attach from the bottom, and that's it. Uh, I'm yeah. confused with what you did before. Uh, yeah. You said that uh, three times three equals six, but three, you said what, with SU3, but. Yeah, 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 this it, is. It's SU3. It's just skewed. But so that one only valid for SU3, but the line above valid for SU1. But the fundamental representation for SU3 yeah. has that dimension, like it would Three. be like n squared minus one. No, that's the edge one. So, so the fundamental representation just means that the dimension of your representation is equals to the dimension of the defining matrix for SU3. Okay. And the SU3 is defined to be the unitary three by three matrix. So, so basically what do we have done is that uh, for SUN, there is a interesting drawing box way of finding all the EREPs. And uh, the, each little box is a fundamental representation. And then each, the, in the row, each row means they are symmetric indexes. In each column means they are anti-symmetric indexes, and each young tableau means some crazy object with many indexes, symmetric and asymmetric in some following way. And then each young tableau will give us an irreducible representation. And if we have that, we can build bigger ones by keep attaching boxes to find a more irreducible representation. Okay. So I guess this is a good time to stop. There's not that much I can say in the next five minutes. When should we come back? Because we're going to talk about something completely not related to Young Tableau. We'll actually try to classify all the Lie algebra in the next um, one hour or infinite hours, depends on which approach we take. OK. So, right, so, oh, hey, people. Can we restart the recording in 10 minutes? Yes. Thank you, we restarted <laughs> 10 20. Yes, it worked. There was somebody. Go that we talked about. In the first lecture, we want to classify all the Lie algebras. The semi-simple means that it doesn't have a abelian subgroup that's abelian invariant subgroup, something like that. But basically, they say deal with all these Lie algebras, and you should be able to figure out all the rest. So recall what we did with SU2. We say, ha, we decided J3 is special then we're going to diagonalize them and use its eigenstate to build the vector space we're so fond of. And then we'll build a J plus, J minus 
such that j3 uh, acting j plus minus give us j plus minus plus minus j plus plus minus, then we'll use eigenstate m's to build our vector space and write down the representation of the generator and such and such. And at the end of the lecture, Tomas has a good question, says why do we have only one label? Well, it's because we only have one special guy that is diagonalized, one special generator. And I think we have another very good question. It's all related to what we're gonna do today. So, okay, so, bef so we're gonna try to figure out how to find the representations for all the Lie algebra. But this reminds me a story. No, we deserve a story after one lecture. So it reminds me of a story of a mathematician who wants to be a firefighter. So then he studied his how to put out a fire and stuff, and then he goes to the interview. And the officer asks him, so suppose you're walking on the street and you saw a dumpster on fire, what would you do? And my suggestion, yes, you have step one, you go to a fire hose and then you get a water and you use bucket of water, put out a fire, standard stuff. And then the officer says, huh, second question. What if you walk on the street and find a dumpster that is not on fire? The medicine manager says, I'll put it on fire. The officer says, well, that's a horrible thing. Why would you put something not on fire on fire? Well, he says, well, then I reduce it to a previously solved problem. <laughs> so that's exactly what I'm going to do. We're not, 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 not setting a dumpster on fire, per se. <laughs> We're going to try to reduce all the Lie algebra to SU2. OK. That's what I'm going to try to do and see how, will, how shall we succeed. And then we still need some geometry miracle to actually be able to classify all of them. But let's do our first step, reduce to SU2. Okay. So general recipe. is that I'm going to find this time more than one things that uh, remember everything in this bracket, they all mutually commute. And this is what we call the Catan subalgebra. Sub this is done, and then let's say the dimension of this guy is rank R, so we have R of them, they all mutually commute. And next step is to find the linear combination of other generators such that they are eigenstate, eigenvectors. So we demand that the HI acting on whatever we find, labeled the same by E, will give us some number, say, of I times E of. So suppose this is the possible, too. Well, you have lots of generators, and you imagine that the, the linear combination of some will satisfy this eigenvector equation. So what do we do next? Well, 
let's suppose this happened. I, indeed, I find a, a generator E alpha, which is the eigenvector of all this Cartan subalgebra. And then first question we ask is, what if I take a adjoint of this thing? So if I take a adjoint of this guy, it'll give me, well, these guys are real because they are eigenvalues of this Catan algebra, which are Hermitian operators, supposed to have real eigenvalues. So if I do that, I get which gave me the commutator of this guy, I, which tells us actually E alpha dagger is also one of these eigenvectors, except it comes with the exactly opposite eigenvalues. So what we conclude is E alpha dagger is E equals to E to the minus alpha. Okay, that's just our naming convention. We're going to use the eigenvalues to label these eigenvectors. And what we discover is, hey, once you find one, you, can, you always find a pair. The Hermitian conjugate of the generator you find is also one of such nice generators. And this should really remind you of J plus dagger equals J minus. Okay? What's the next thing to do? Well, remember after we, put, we find a J plus, and we wonder, huh, what does J plus do? on, say, a eigenvector of these HI, this, this Catan subalgebra. So let's figure that out, too. So suppose I have eigenstate, something labeled by a mu. It's mu is just says it has eigenvalue mu one under h one, mu two under h two, dali dali dala. Suppose I have this, and I wonder what happened if I acting E alpha plus on it. It's an interesting question to know, since it has it reminds us something like J plus minus. It's even this step. It reminds us J plus minus. This is what we did for SU2. It looks like a raising operator of some sort. And let's see what it does. And what it does is that, well, we can use our commutator relationship, which I'm sure that now you get really familiar about how to use them, because we use them so many times. Oh, sorry. We're just say acting the E alpha, not the complex. And the first guy says it's a, the commutator is given by this guy. And the second guy says it's an eigenstate of HI, so it's given by this guy. So it says that once you act E alpha on the mu state, it should be proportional to mu plus alpha. Hmm? 
sort of behave like our J plus J minus. You give me a state, I act on E alpha, I get some other state, I get some other state, I get some other state. You get some letters like that. Okay. So now, here is a fun question. Remember our generators? They themselves, they form a vector space. They're also states. So now here is a question that says, if I act to E alpha, acting on the state has eigenvalue minus alpha, which this guy is really E minus alpha two, what do I get? Like you have zero or something? I have a zero. Good. So, very good. So if we act on the state minus alpha by alpha, according to this rule, it gives me zero. Well, you say it's proportion to the zero state to be. more clear. Or you can say that if I have, if I act another H on it, this thing will give me zero. Okay, so about this state zero, what it really means by all our convention is that this really means that H i acting on state zero gives me zero. Right? So in other words, I can write this, so remember a fun fact, about the adjoint representation, which we are talking about because the other generators. So this is supposed to give me the commutator of E alpha and E minus alpha. And what we know is this is going to give some operator that a commute with H, otherwise the eigenvalue wouldn't be zero. So if you have a state zero. Chuck, what is supposed to be the computer? This guy. So remember if you, what we learned from last time, that uh, there is a fun fact of adjoint representation, is that you can use the representation as a operator and acting on the basis vector will give you the commutator of the state. Right? So then that commutator should be in a then. Right. Thank you. This guy should be in the bracket. And what we know is that this guy has eigenvalue zero. So this means HI <coughs> acting on the state gave me zero, right? So this is one way of looking at things. But we can also go back to this way of looking at the same things. So this is one way to say that this vector formed by the commutator of E alpha and E minus alpha has eigenvalue zero under HI. But remember, we can also write this so this is what it 
the mat. Right? It's just two ways of telling the same story. It's like this guy. I can also write it as HI acting on the state E alpha give me alpha I. You can write it like this way, or write it like that. And this is the conclusion we get from acting E alpha onto minus alpha. And I can also write the conclusion like this. Yep. Why do you sometimes label states with mu and alpha and sometimes with E alpha? Do you, right. So is there any difference in those? OK, so this state is exactly the same if I write the generator. Oh. It's just sometimes if it's like this, I can't write in the simple way. So this always means this, but there are some cases I can't use this if it's a count. Well, I can't. Then there will be zero. But then I can't make my argument. So is it clear here? OK. So basically, it says this guy commutes with all the sub, all the Catan sub -algebra. Well, there, there's only one way this is possible. Remember that when we build our Catan sub algebra, we already include everybody that commutes with each other. And if this somehow is another one commute with every single body in the sub algebra, why didn't we include this? And the only way that we, this is going to work is this guy is actually some combination, linear combination of, of the generators we already included. That indeed, this guy will commute with everybody in the sub algebra. Right? And this is also sort of good. Remember that we sort of want to identify this as j plus. This one is j minus. And we know j plus, j minus will give me back j3. And we're sort of trying to mimic this. So it's good that we figure out the commutator of this guy equals some combination of h which, remember, J3 also belongs to the sub -algebra. So everything seems to be clicking. OK, now we have to figure out what's AI. Take an educated guess. What would AI be? It's a, a list of numbers. And there are R of them. What could it possibly be? How do we want to linear combine this sub algebra for a guy that has eigenvalue alpha vector, which has R of them? And each number is the alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha, alpha. Some of them, you are smiling very loudly. Well, very silently, but loudly. <laughs> so what's our educated guess for this AIs? What's our choices? We want to have some r-dimensional vectors such that we can linear combine r of these hx. Exponentials or something like that. We call it one. Oh my god, you're going for very complicated things. Okay. <laughs> Look, I want a r-dimensional vectors. And what r dimensional vector we're given for some generator E labeled by its eigenvalues R? OK, never mind. Let's go through the derivation then. 
So let me, again, rewrite this using the fun language of, so let me, again, using this, this thing, just going back and forth between commutators or states, except this time I can now identify AI as the matrix element of E alpha between these two vectors. Right? Let's continue. And it says write this as the commutator. Not achieving much. But this, by definition, it's an inner product of two vectors, so I can write according to my definition, I'll write it as the trace of the matrices. And then, let me expand this. And I'm going to use the cyclic property so it'll be all right if I just move HI over here. And then move this E alpha in front. Gone? Yep. Could you leave the four a little bit? Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. So it's a bunch of manipulations. So as the M calculator matrix element, let's do it. I'm actually left a generator on a generator so I can write it as a commutator. And now I'm just calculating the scalar product, the inner product, which is defined by the trace of the matrices. So let's take a trace. And then when that happens, I'm very happily just cyclicking the trace, such that now I can regroup them together to be the commutator. But I know this commutator. It would have given me minus alpha if it's the other way. So this will actually give me alpha i. So I can take the alpha i out. I get the trace of e alpha and e minus alpha, which is e alpha dagger. But this is how I normalize things. So this gives me alpha i. So this shouldn't be a huge surprise. I have one r-dimensional vector alpha i in town. And I need one of these r-dimensional vector to linear com combine my hi's to find, figure out what's the commutator. The natural choice is it's the same. And you can actually prove with a bunch of manipulation that it is indeed the same. Okay, so what we accomplished so far is we have E alpha acting on HI, give me alpha I, E alpha. Wait, did I write it? No, wrong, sorry. HI acting E alpha, give me this. And I also have HI acting E minus alpha, of course, give me minus alpha I, this. And now, in addition of that, I just figure out that E alpha and E minus alpha will give me alpha dot H. This is all we 
is possible. If you have a Lie algebra, I can build a Catan subalgebra such that I find a bunch of these HIs, they commute with each other. And furthermore, I can find a pair which is adjoint of each other, and their commutator will go back to the sub to the Catan sub -L. So this has been accomplished. All right, now I just say, I really want you to look exactly like SU2. So let's see what we have for SU2. For SU2, I have this. So what can we do? What are we going to do? Is it going to really force this to happen? We're going to say that let's define that uh, e plus minus is equals to e alpha plus minus alpha with some coefficient a. And we'll also say e3 is seemingly proportionally to alpha dot h with some coefficient b, such that HI acting E3 acting E plus minus give me E plus plus minus E plus minus back and E plus E minus will give me E3. So we're really saying we're going to redefine our generator such that we will see exactly an SU2. We're going to build our SU2 sub Lie algebra using the generators of any Lie algebra. And let's see how that happens. So, this, how this is going to work? Well, we're going to solve for A and B, which can't be that hard. So, E3 acting on E plus minus is equals to B alpha dot H acting on small a E plus minus alpha. So this gives me B A and uh, alpha So there is alpha there, but the one H acting on this gives me more alphas. So the way I get alpha square. Okay. Then I can reabsorb that to give me the E plus minus. So this immediately gave me that a b should be defined to be 1 over alpha square. And then e plus e minus commutator, each of them will pick up a factor of a, so it should be a square of e plus E alpha, E minus alpha, which gave me R A square alpha dot H, and which is supposed to be equals B alpha dot H, because that's what we define to be three. So A is really one over alpha. 
magnetic. So now we're done. We successfully find our SU2. It's defined to be we normalize our generator by 1 over alpha and we normalize our alpha some combination of the thing to be E3. So this is our SU2. So what I have been shown is indeed it's possible. Given the Lie algebra come with a bunch of generators and I can form an SU2. This is really SU2 because it has the exact SU2 structure like this. Okay? So, we have already set our dumpster on fire. So this is something we know how to solve. If we have such a SU2 subalgebra, we can just find the eigenstate and then start building it. Almost. We find the one SU2 subalgebra. And the rank R indicates that we should find R of them. Okay, so now it comes the miracle part. But before, before the miracle, let, let's figure out, uh, say, for example, let's say there is an eigenstate. Let's just say, so our goal is that there must be more of these SU2 subalgebra, but let's say there are some of them like is labeled by E beta. It's like go back to step one. And besides this generator we already used to form E alpha, there must be some leftover generators. And we can find, say, another pair, E beta and E beta dagger. And this can be labeled as my state beta. So now we want to do something about the state beta. For example, we want to figure out what's the eigenvalue under our SU2 Lie algebra we just find. Let's use our powerful rule that we found the SU2 and we ask the question what's E3 acting on beta? Well, this, this is not hard at all because we demand that this beta has eigenvalue beta underneath the H, sys. So you get something like this. So why is it so amazing? Well, remember what we built is an SU2. We know something about these eigenvalues. What do we know about them? We emphasize all sorts of ways and we use a mug rolling around and use a belt trick. And all we want to say is that whenever you see a SU2 the algebra, you find an eigenstate of this J3 or E3. What kind of eigenvalue can we get? A half integer. A half integer, very good. The conclusion is this guy should be a half integer. Okay. On the other hand, this guy should be an integer after multiply by two. Okay. Oh, I can make this argument in a different direction. Let's say, okay, I forgot this thing. So that's what we know. And how is that going to help us? We'll see. <coughs> So now, we again, we are curious what happens if we act E plus on this state. And we wonder what's the new eigenvalue. A 
again, we can use we can use our commutator, and this is really literally built to look like an SU2. So what do you expect we're going to get? This will, of course, give us the original eigenvalue plus one. Or we can write it some different way, which agrees with whatever we just figure out, is that uh, the E alpha is going to bring beta to alpha plus beta state. Right? It's the same argument we used before. If you start with some beta state, you act E plus on it, you're going to move to this state and acting more E plus on it, then you get this eigenvalue and then you just keep going. And then what we claim is that we want this process to terminate. So if we start with something like this, Suppose after p step, we reach the highest weight j. And we can also suppose going the other direction. Now we know from the experience with SU2, if you're going down with g minus, or e minus now, you will hit the lowest of weight minus j status. And so let's add up these things together. And we say, hey, p is some number of step. It's an integer. j is some number of step. So it's also an integer. Hey, so this must be an integer. And wait, but I already know that. That's what we know just because it's an eigenvalue of E3. So what's the point? Well, hopefully there's a point. No, no, no. That. OK. This is the most important point of this lecture, and I distract you with some random movement of the board. OK, let me rewrite that again. So what do we just find out is that the 2 times alpha dot beta divided by alpha square plus equals to say some q minus p, which from two arguments, now we're really solid sure about this thing being an integer thing. So what's the next step? The next step is where the miracle happens. It says, what I've been doing is pick a pair of generators E alpha and E minus alpha. Try my best to force that into a SU2 sublayer algebra. And study what happens to some other E beta and E minus beta we didn't choose. And see what happens. But look, besides those guys are mutually commuting and we put it in the center, says you guys are this really awesome sub Catan sub Lie algebra, and we're gonna build a state using our eigenstate. All the other generators are sort of equal. I could have chosen E beta and E minus beta to be my special pair, which I can build some E plus minus prime, E three prime, some other you know, cute SU2 subalgebra 
for example, I can even write, to, write it down for you. I could have, all I can still do it now, is to choose e plus minus equals one over beta, e plus minus beta, and choose e3 to be one over beta square, beta dot h. But nobody permits me to do this. It's as good a pair as the first pair, right? There's no discrimination and they are all equal. And nothing is more equal in this case. And I can carry through this calculation says, huh, now let's consider a state alpha, how this state alpha would behave under this subalgebra. So everything I have said would completely follow. The only thing we need to do is to switch alpha and the beta. Right? OK, it works. OK, so I'm going to switch alpha and the beta. I'll write it up here. So it tells us if I switch, call all the alpha beta, call all the beta alpha, it should still work. It should still give me an integer. Maybe it's a different number of q steps and the p steps. Let's call it a q prime and a p prime. But that equation should hold. The only thing I do is to pick a different pair to start with. I have two pairs of generators. I can pick whichever I want. Okay? Where is the miracle? Now let's multiply them together. What I get is 4 times alpha dot beta square divided by alpha square beta square. And that should also equal the integer. Because we're just multiplying <coughs> integer with integer. OK? Does it remind you anything? What's alpha dot beta divided by alpha modulo divided by beta? Oh, it's like an angle. Uh-huh. Cosine square of the angles. That's Very good. good. This is a cosine theta square. A theta is like between alpha and beta. It's an integer. It should be like a what? Isn't the cosine theta supposed to be take any value between 0 and 1? This says no. What this says is that given the Lie algebra, and you can find all the eigenvalues of your generator, and the angle between them has a really strong constraint. This is really strong. And it, it's also nice enough, I can list all the possible value for you. This is literally can take between 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. That's it. And then I can actually list all the possible angle for you. It says that if you are some eigenvectors coming from a Lie algebra. The only angle you can form for the zero case, which gives us 90 degree, and for the one case, gives us 60 degree and 120 degree, and for the Case give me 45 degree and 135 degree, and then give me 30 degree and 150 degree, and then there is zero degree and 180 degree. Okay, the last one is not interesting. It says it's the same eigenvector. So before you would think. All this alpha can be anything. 
But now it's not. Once you find one eigenvector, the rest is sort of all. You only have a finite set of value to choose. So let us restrict ourselves. R equals 2. Or just because R equals 2, I can draw it. So, so when we mention these things are angles, they are really angles. You can draw them on the plane. If they are real angles formed by real vectors. So suppose I pick my first choice of a 90 degree, I can always choose my first vector to be 1, 0. But then, if I say my choice, <coughs> choose 90 degree, then it says my beta can only be here. And there's the H1 and H2 sitting in the middle. So now we have happily plotted all our generators on the two-dimensional plane if we make the assumption that the angle between the two, which are called the root vector, which are basically the two eigenvector eigenvectors for for the generators, and then we obtain something like this. And this is really saying, look, there is an SU two over here, and there is also an SU two over here, and they are all orthogonal. They don't even talk to each other. And this is the curious equation, if you still remember, from first, second lecture. This is the proof for SO4 is actually the two direct sum of SU2. Because they are orthogonal. They don't interfere with each other. <coughs> And why that is so forth? No. Well, I can give, give you a very, very crude proof that it has six. And if you really want to say how you can combine the SO4, so SO4 would have, have like J1 through J3. So if you count like a J, J1 through J3, and there is K1 through K3. OK. So. SO4 has six rotations. There is a rotation <coughs> and there is also the rotation with the last step. And if you write down the Lie algebra for SO4, you can show that these three form a SU2 subalgebra and this three form another SU2 subalgebra, and they don't talk to each other. And you have to do some linear combination to make sure they become, but it is possible. All right, so let's carry on, and then draw one more of these root diagrams, which <laughs> You, so now we're just using geometry, really. What it says, it says that uh, it can only form this angle and let's draw it. And in the afternoon, you actually specifically given eight generators of SU3 and look for this H and E alpha and E minus alpha, then you know exactly where the root vector should be drawing on the graph, and go for it, and find the beta and such. 
But let me just make still educated guesses. And there's not much choices if you told me that they has to form, say, 60 degree angles. So there's still H1 and H2 sitting in the middle. And so suppose this is first alpha, and then I want to draw a 60 degree guy. So this is my beta. And then because we're in rank two, that's the only independent one. And the only thing I can do now is form a linear transformation of this guy. So I found the guy here. And then this is my minus alpha, this is minus beta, this is my gamma, this is minus gamma. And this way, I can make sure that all the root vectors form 60 degrees. <clears throat> I, can, so yeah. I don't really like understand what what you mean by like choose 60 degrees. Like where I'm choosing like, this angle to be 60 degrees. Okay, yeah, like I know that, but I mean, uh -huh. like. For instance, it, what are you still talking about? Like SU four being decomposed into SU two. Oh, SU2? like what are you? Good, good point. No, like, this, I, I, this is this is a different. This is this is an example number two. Okay, but like choose sixty degrees is is like an unclear starting point, right? Like I don't know what you mean by choose sixty degrees. So very good. Like. Uh -huh. Out of, like, how do you know what other possible choices? Well, there are, there's all the possible choices out there, right? Okay. Okay. There's 90 degrees. So, so, so what? Like you stop at four on the integers, right? So, like, you're, well, you, you're choosing an integer, right? Right. Okay. So, what integer are you choosing? I'm choosing six degrees. So, one. Yeah. Now, the idea is we're dealing with a rank two. Lie algebra, which means there are only two independent vectors. Okay. Right? But that's okay. And they will form an angle, and this angle should be from so, that least. So why are you labeling three and three vectors there then? They're not, They're not independent though. Right, okay, so that's why we're on the plane. Okay, so there are two independent vectors. Who are there on the are plane. two independent vectors, and the rest can be formed by adding them. Okay, so, so you, the starting point is you chose the integer to be 1, and right. that dictates that we have angles to be 60 degrees. And what dictates, dictates you choosing the rank of the? No, I'm just saying I'm starting with rank two. So rank three, I can't really draw on four. Right, OK. So you're I can bring all my all of these things. cute dice. You can actually, you can like Google the root diagram for a rank three algebra, and then, then they can sort of draw on, on those tetrahedral things. OK. So when you choose an angle, are you kind of choosing the algebra? Yeah. That's exactly why this is a miracle is that all the Lie algebra is here. Uh, all the Lie algebra is already written down. And now we're just drawing. <coughs> so that's all the Lie algebra. That's all the Lie algebras. Well, you could have more than two. So for round two, this is all the Lie algebra. It tells us two of the, uh, the two bases eigenvector form such an angle. That's it. You can draw one for this guy, draw one for that guy, draw one for that guy, draw one for that guy. So there are four. So if you were to choose the 0, 1, and 180 degree case, would that be? That would be SU. SU. Yeah, that would be SU too. So you you lost one of the rank because the, the, uh, the angle is like this, then you are not independent anymore. So this is really gave you SU too. But so this is only for some simple. Right. And then the 
there are some appealing factors. People know how to deal with them. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's why this is a miracle. So this is at least this is a least of all. every single possible S to run the two Lie algebra. It's on this list. It says there is a Lie algebra such that it has two <coughs> root factors form a 90 degree. There is also a Lie algebra that the two root vectors form 6 degree. And there is one forming a 45 degree and one forming 180 degree. So actually, Alan's question make it, it's probably a good time to introduce the concept of positive roots. So all these vectors are somehow called the roots for some reason. I have no idea why. But the positive roots says draw a cut your space in half. And half of them will be positive, the other half will be negative. And now, then there is the definition of simple roots. And the simple roots are chosen such that I can express the non-simple ones as a linear combination of the simple ones with positive coefficient. So for example, I have this. So these two are the simple roots. Um, sorry, what do you mean by put in half and half are positive? So there is this point. So I can, you can cut it any way you want. And then you, you, just, you just define half the negative. Yeah, these half are positive, the other half are negative. It's called uh, the two, class, two, two, two category classification. If you call, you, you can always define a set A. It's a set called A and the complementary of A. And this is exactly how they define the positive roots. So it's cut this root. I guess sometimes it's called a lattice because the generator literally leave there. Cut the lattice through the center in half. And let's call half of them positive roots, the other half negative roots. And we know negative roots are always there because we showed that. And they say, let's choose the simple roots. The simple roots is chosen such as the non-simple one will be a linear combination of the simple one with positive coefficient, positive integer coefficient. And then you realize if you are only talking about the angle of between the simple roots, you are really talking about all the, the Dow angles, not the, cute, not the acute angles. Right? Such that you can express all the roots in the middle as the sum of these ones. So you're, when I should say choose 6 degree, I should have said choose 120 degrees. OK. And then here is where Dinkin comes in. So it's now we can classify all the rest. So in today's in today's tutorial, you are going to draw the other two Lie algebra. And one of them, if you count the number of generators, it happens to have 10 of them. So you have SO5. It is the 135 degree case. And then you also find something has 14 generators. And the people, they are not, a, they, 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 it's one of the special ones, it's called a J2. And this is why you choose the simple rules to form 150 degree. And then the mathematician says, oh, let's continue this process and draw this beautiful, another so beautiful root letters on 3D and the 4D and the et cetera, et cetera. 
And Dinkin says, well, it's going to be very hard to draw. So Dinkin comes up with the Dinkin diagram, says, let's draw our Lie algebra and only use simple roots. And he has the following way of condensing this into several dots. And he says, I'm going to use a notation. Each circle is a simple root. And if they are disconnected, this means 90 degree. It means it doesn't talk to each other. It turns out if it has 120 degree, it's the most common one. He says, I'll draw a line between them. So this is the same as this hexagon. <clears throat> and then he says, let's just draw two lines if it's 135 degree, and I draw three lines if it's 150 degree. So instead of drawing a bunch of root diagrams to represent the Lie algebra, it says, he says it's sufficient just to point it out the relationship between the simple roots. OK. And then he says, sometimes I will fill in a dot. And that just means this root is shorter. And this, you explore in the afternoon and realize this is SO5. Well, in this case, it doesn't matter which one you fill in. And then he says, OK, now I can list all. So this can be also, so he says, all the semi-simple Lie algebra can also be made into a t-shirt. So what yeah. is that the root is shorter? Well, if you look at this graph and the graph I just showed, they are the same lines. Sorry? They're the same lens, literally the same lens. The, the lens of this vector. Yeah. And in the afternoon, when you practice drawing the guy with a 135 degree, you'll realize if I fix those two roots of the same lens, there's no way you can draw a diagram, finish your diagram. You have to make the two vector different lens, such that you can actually draw a diagram. Like it, figure out where all the other generators are. Like we can try. OK, this is called a failed attempt. So suppose I have this guy and this guy. And uh, so this is like square root. And this is one, right? So if I move this guy up, and it will land somewhere here. And you can just keep trying to make vectors. And then eventually, you will reach a point. So for example, this guy is not going, this angle doesn't belong to this list, which means you fail. Like, if you start with this two vector as your simple roots, you're going to run into some vector that doesn't form a valid angle with other angles. And it's really you have to experience what's the ratio of this two vector such that you can make sure all the linear combination of them will still follow the rule, which is any eigenvectors can only form that, those angles that are supposed to be. So that's what we meant. Sometimes one root needs to be short. It's dictated by the geometry. Yeah? So you can't do scalar multiplication. You can only add. Huh? You can only add the. You can, so that's what they meant by simple roots, is that uh, you can only do 
you can only use integer coefficient. I mean, this makes sense. Remember, like this, 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 this is coming from when we add to e alpha onto beta, we are gonna get the state alpha plus beta, and then you can add it again, get a two alpha plus beta. Right, this is called the step. The step size is only one of them. So that's why you can't come up with any coefficient. Well, if you come up with any coefficient, then you get the whole plane. Okay, right, so now Debbie should have a bunch of protractors and acute triangles with, you know, things that you can measure these special angles out and you could play around. And you will realize to form SO5, you indeed need some vectors shorter than the others. Okay, so the rest is just a t-shirt. We should really make this t-shirt. Says that there is a series of Lie algebra. It is formed by all the simple roots forming 120 degree. And you, it's called the A series. And the next one says all the roots are forming 120 degrees, except there's one of them is forming a 135 degree. And then they say this guy actually could be all the ones the other way. So there is like one short one, a bunch of long ones, and the other way is everything is short except one of them. And then there is also a bunch of guys called the D series, looks like this. And then there are five of them. So there is at two, rank two, you get a J2. At the rank four, you get an F4. And then there's the fable, the E6, E7, E8. It says that your root vector always look, your simple roots always look this. And then somehow it doesn't go up anymore. It just looks like this. It ends with E8. Okay, maybe you need the both the front part and the back part of the t-shirt. But that's all the layout, simple, semi-simple layout. And there were mathematicians just prove that if you have this angle constraints, that's all you're gonna get. What, what does it mean that there's a circle up? It just means... Uh, another? Huh? Hey, so, so for example, if you want to in interpret this, first it tells us it's a rank six Lie algebra. It has six simple roots. And they say if they're connected by a line, it means that they form 120 degree. And if they're not connected, they form 90 degree. So this basically tells you the angles between any pair of the simple roots. Okay. So that's why there is this rule, this rule. It says not connected means forming 90. So this means there is this one special root from 120 degree with three of them, and all the rest has fewer partners. <coughs> So this is definitely a great time to stop. So this is the end of the Lie algebra class. And there was a lot more things you can ask. I can probably not answer it, but I'll try to learn them first. And this afternoon, we'll have a somewhat long tutorial, as indicated on your account. All right. See you in the afternoon.